Support for Ben Franklin's World and the Doing History to the Revolution series comes from the Omohundro Institute and the Great Courses Plus. Throughout the 18th century, tea played a central role in the economic, cultural, and political lives of early Americans. And as a result of its centrality, tea developed a complicated economic and political history. In fact, because of its complicated economic and political history, tea came to play a sizable role in the escalating tensions between Great Britain and her 13 British North American colonies during the 1760s and 1770s. Now, you may recall that in episode 112, the very first episode in the Doing History to the Revolution series, we had a conversation with Mary Beth Norton, the Mary Donlan Alger Professor of American History at Cornell University, who shared with us the story of the seventh tea ship. And during our conversation, Mary Beth shared with us the important role that tea played in colonial British American culture. All the contemporary observers said that Americans drank prodigious. That was a word that I picked up from the documents, prodigious amounts of tea, and that all parts of American society at the time were addicted to tea. There's even a wonderful account of a foreign traveler on the frontier seeing Mohawk Indians drinking tea. So everybody seems to have drunk a lot of tea. But there's also a real cultural and social meaning to tea in the 18th century in North America. It's valued for its role in women socializing. I mean, the standard belief at the time was that men socialized in taverns over ale and women socialized over tea in their homes. And so there's a massive amount of literature about the cultural significance of tea parties. As early as the 1720s, people in newspapers are are parodying women in tea parties, supervising, having tea very genteely with their friends, with women and some men, and socializing and gossiping. There's a whole parody of women gossipers, and there's a lot of complaints about women gossiping over tea and wasting time over tea and so forth. So we know that it's very important. There's a big cultural value placed on tea. We know from people who studied consumer culture in the 18th century that the first consumer good that a family that gets a little money buy is a teapot because it means you have some little claim to gentility. And then after you buy the teapot, then you start to buy proper teacups and you'd buy the accoutrement of the teapot. You'd buy a sugar bowl and a cream pitcher and things like that. And you'd buy a tea table or a tea tray on which you would display all this china when your friends came to visit and then pull it out and use. So it was actually of tremendous cultural importance. This socializing over tea was very important. Now, in addition to discussing the central place tea had in many early Americans' lives, Mary Beth also took us through why the tea that arrived in Boston Harbor in late 1773 became a prime target for the Sons of Liberty and their famous tea party. Which begs the question, how did early Americans go from tea parties to the Boston Tea Party? Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. In order for us to understand the important role that tea played in the history of the American Revolution, We really need to take a closer look at the way tea developed as a global commodity, as a luxury good, and how it served as a centerpiece of some elite women's political expressions. And that's what we're going to do in this episode. We're going to make a close exploration of tea so that we can see how the American Revolution gained expression through British Americans' embrace and rejection of this important luxury good, which happened to fuel a social ritual as important to early Americans as the coffee shop is for us. Our investigation of tea should begin with how tea became a thing or a popular good in British North America. Because understanding how British Americans became acquainted with and traded for tea will help us better understand not only early American tea culture, 
why tea came to play such a big role in the American Revolution. Jane Merritt is a professor of history at Old Dominion University, and her recent book is aptly titled The Trouble with Tea, The Politics of Consumption in the 18th Century Global Economy. In her book, Jane explores the global reach of tea and the ways that as a global commodity, it became so important to British North America. Jane, thank you so much for joining us. We're trying to better understand tea and its role in the American Revolution, and we're curious about how the British trade in tea developed. Would you tell us about the founding of the English East India Company and how it developed its trade in tea? Think about the East India Company as kind of starting out as a loose confederation of merchants who were given sanction, right, by Elizabeth I in 1600 to go to what was broadly called the East Indies. Indonesia, China, Japan, and to trade goods there. Granted, a kind of monopoly, but even within that group of traders, there was a lot of disagreement. And over the 17th century, they split into factions. And it wasn't really until the 18th century in 1709, when the company that we know of as the East India Company united and was granted a charter and monopoly powers over trade in the East Indies. So. It really comes about over the course of the 17th century, but emerges as this corporation or company in 1709. It seems like the English East India Company could have used its charter and monopoly to trade for just about anything in the East Indies. And yet, one of its biggest commodities was tea. So how did the company become involved with the tea trade? Well, tea, you know, in China was something that was light and easy to transport. It was something that seemed exotic to Europeans. And I think initially, it was one of the few things that they could trade European manufacturers for. Silk was certainly another item. Gold and silver were also key commodities. But tea really emerges initially as an item of trade. You know, the Chinese really restricted access by Europeans to Canton, near where Hong Kong is today. So the English, as well as the Dutch, the French, etc., all had this very narrow window and opportunity to trade with the Chinese. And tea becomes this commodity, not just something that they could purchase and sell to Europeans, but it becomes a kind of piece that European powers competed over, right? Global trade at that point, you know, by the 17th and 18th century, was as much about political competition between nations as it was about bringing consumer items back to England. Great Britain, France, Spain, the Netherlands, all the European powers traded in the East Indies. Was it the imperial competition you mentioned between these empires also what caused the English East India Company to extend its trade in East Indies goods to North America? Yeah, kind of in a roundabout way. You know, in the 1720s and 30s, when the East India Company is trying to make inroads into the Chinese markets. They are competing with the Dutch, with the French, the Danish, you know, the Swedish. Each of them have these merchant corporations at work in Canton in China. And the thing to do was to corner the market in tea in particular as a way of getting rid of this competition. Right? We don't want the Dutch to get a hold of this green tea, this bohia, which is a black tea. We'll corner the market as much as we can, and we'll oust them from that commercial trade. But, you know, by the 1720s, 1730s, the East India Company finds that it has all this supply of tea on hand, and it hadn't really become a commodity that was widely bought, right? So they have warehouses full of tea by the 1730s without necessarily markets to purchase it all. Therefore, the East India Company, through its merchants in London, turned to North America, especially as a place they hope to create a market, right? We hope to create consumers for this good. So how did the company go about creating a market or consumers in North America for all their excess tea? Well, you get a lot of American merchants on board buying it through their wholesalers in London. At this point, you know, East India Company is not able to sell tea or goods directly to North America. They bring it back to London. They put up sale of tea and silks at auction every year. 
And then British merchants who purchase this are the ones who then retail and sell either wholesale or in lots to American merchants. So through the help of these merchant middlemen in England, they help Americans advertise, right? You start to see the emergence of newspaper advertisements, pamphlets, and flyers that tout East India goods, you know, the nicest silks, the best teas, the highest quality teas are here for you. This new shipment has just arrived. So advertising is part of it. And I think that American merchants themselves start to kind of use this product, right, as well to kind of show people how to drink tea. You know, this wasn't always apparent to people in the 17 teens and 1720s of how to brew and how to consume tea. So through kind of imitation as well as advertising, by the 1740s, really, you see the sale of tea kind of taking off in North America. When the English East India Company helped to create this taste for tea in British North America, did they have a specific target demographic or customer base that they wanted to sell to? Or did they really hope that the market for tea would be all British North Americans? I think that many people saw it as an elite kind of beverage initially. And certainly anyone who could afford to buy tea in, the, say, the 17 teens and 1720s, when it was sometimes as much as a sterling pound per pound, you know, it was fairly expensive. It was seen as the kind of elite tea, but, you know, as tea became more readily available, the supply becomes more and it becomes cheaper, as it did by the middle of the 18th century. It became accessible to a wide variety of people. I mean, by mid century, you could purchase a pound of tea for about seven to 10 shillings. Now, mind you, a laborer's wages at this time are only about two shillings a day. So if a male laborer can earn two shillings a day, and let's say 10 shillings a week, I mean, that's as much as a pound of tea would retail for. So there's a real conundrum because I noticed, at least in my research, that these laborers, you know, guys who worked on ships, you know, sailors, as well as artisans, you know, I ran into wig makers and sawyers, people who sawed wood and sold that, dressmakers, hat makers, tailors, etc. I mean, all levels of society seem to purchase tea, at least through these merchant ledgers that I looked at. It was a little bit misleading, though, because my initial reaction was, well, wow, I mean, tea by the 1740s became so popular that You know, even sailors are wanting to purchase at least small amounts, you know, a quarter of a pound or a half a pound. But the longer I looked at it, I realized you're looking at an economy that is really what is often called a book economy. Everything you purchased, every way that you were paid for your services or goods was often done on credit through these ledger accounts or book credit. And so I kind of stepped back and I thought, well, maybe it's not the demand of this sailor for tea that's driving these, what are often called the lower sorts, to purchase tea. In fact, here are merchants that in the 1730s and even into the 1740s have been urged to purchase this tea through their London contacts. And that, in fact, to pay for services like wig making or tailors or dressmakers that they are paying these people in tea because they have it on hand and it's a ready available commodity. So it's kind of a chicken and egg question. You know, did the demand for tea come first or did sort of the distribution, right, and supply of tea come first? And I'm thinking that until the 1740s, it's really this supply, right, this oversupply by the East India Company that trickles down to American merchants who are then urged through advertising to take this commodity off their hands because they have a lot of excess of it. And through the payment of the other people who work for them or who purchase things from them, do service for them by paying them with tea and little things like sugar or other luxury items, that they're actually habituating these workers to it as a commodity. We've been talking about how tea became popular among British North Americans. And in Jane's book, The Trouble with Tea, Jane describes how tea importation informed part of the so-called consumer revolution. Jane, would you tell us about the British American consumer revolution 
and specifically about the role tea played in that revolution? It's certainly something that we debate about as cultural historians, as economic historians. But the idea is that, you know, by the 17th century, there is this increased global trade networks to the East Indies, to places like Muscovia and Eastern Europe, into the Mediterranean, and a lot of new exotic goods are being brought back. You know, things that people didn't have every day, sugar and chocolate and tea, coffee, silks, and certainly spices from Indonesia. Increased global trade certainly meant that these goods are now more readily available. So, you know, the circulation of goods, the increased number and availability of these goods really are revolutionary in the sense that they're there. But I think that the real revolution comes when the meaning of those goods changes, right? Things that were once seen as luxuries, as items for elite consumption by the middle of the 18th century are cheaper and are even becoming necessities, right? So the meaning of these goods is changing. Now with tea, for instance, the changing meaning and availability of it gets tied up in these debates over the morality of luxury consumption. Was tea a drug? Many people called it an opiate, a drug of the masses, right? Or was it simply a pleasure? You know, was it addictive? There were real concerns that this was a substance that would become addictive. Or was it something that invigorated a worker, right? It gave them more energy to be more productive. So in the early 18th century in particular, these debates over the morality and meaning of tea were prevalent. And I have to say that this morality debate is often tied to women and their relationship to tea. Often women were targeted and told that they were idle if they sat around a tea table and drank tea. They were spreading gossip. They were spreading scandal. They were seen as weak, and it was often described as an addictive substance when it was associated with women and their consumption. So it was really, you know, kind of questionable whether this luxury should and could become sort of prolific or ubiquitous in the consumer world. You see that debate, by the way, over the morality of luxuries kind of disappear by the 1760s and 1770s, because by then tea has really become an everyday thing and something that is drunk by everyone and not seen as dangerous in the same sense it is in the 1720s and 30s. Did the morality debate around tea ever discuss smuggling? Because smuggling proved to be so common in the 18th century that some historians have wondered whether or not it was just another description for trade in the Atlantic world. So Jane, would you tell us about smuggling and specifically about tea smuggling? Yeah, you can't really either for Great Britain itself and Ireland or for North America really look at tea separate from smuggling. And I was really challenged, I think, to look at both legal sale of tea, which is well recorded, right, through customs records, as well as the East India Company has its own set of records of auctioning and sale of tea. But because North America during certain periods became haven for smuggling, especially between the Dutch and the French and American merchants, you have to take that path in order to understand tea availability, at least, and if not consumption. But what I found was that it's really both. American merchants kind of used both avenues, both legal purchase and sale of tea as through the East India Company, as well as smuggling. And it really depended on the place. You know, for instance, New England tended to be kind of as people complained about a hotbed of smuggling. The time during wartime, for instance, when cash was scarce. And when commodities and trade routes were often blocked, you know, by war, then Americans often turned to illegal trade in order to supply their consumers with goods that they still demanded. Again, the problems with figuring out the size of that smuggling trade is very difficult. You know, people can guesstimate. Certainly someone like Thomas Hutchinson complained to Great Britain, at least, that Five out of every six pounds of tea that they drink has been smuggled in. So trying to find a balance of what that smuggling tells us 
And what it means was really difficult. Would you tell us more about your comparison of legally imported and sold tea versus smuggled and illegally sold tea? How did people smuggle tea into British North America? And what was the difference in sales price between legally imported and smuggled tea? Think about this as the incentive. Okay. If you think about the tax structure that is put on legally imported tea, and all this tea, by the way, through Great Britain, is East India Company tea because they have a monopoly on purchasing and selling from China. And none of this tea is grown in India yet. That comes in the 19th century. But it is sold through London, through the East India Company that has a monopoly. But here's the kind of layers, right, of taxes that are put on this tea. I mean, first of all, the East India Company has to pay an import duty when it comes to auction. And that's just about 12% of the value, right, of each of these lots that they put on auction. But then on top of that, there are excise duties paid by the merchants and retailers who purchase this tea. And this might include a one to four shilling per pound inland duty tax. It's kind of a distribution tax in some ways. And then what's often called ad valorem or a value added tax of 25% on the value, not the weight of the tea. So you're paying a tax on both the weight of the tea as well as the value of that tea. And by the time you get to retail, you, the consumer, are probably paying at least half of that retail cost is taxes and half perhaps might be what it was initially sold at auction. So by mid 18th century, you know, just your basic black tea was sold at auction, that is by the East India Company, for about three shillings a pound. That's before all these other excise taxes are added to it. Dutch tea at that time could be purchased for just under two shillings a pound. And then you didn't have to worry about, you know, adding the taxes to the cost for Americans. So you're an American merchant, right? And you can go down to St. Eustasis, which is a Dutch West Indies colony, and you can purchase a barrel of 300 pounds of tea at one shilling, 11 pence, versus the lot of tea that you purchase through merchant middleman in London, which, you know, after the tax is added might be six or seven shillings a pound. And, you know, you do the math. (laughs) It's cost effectiveness, I think, for Americans is clear. You know, the British are constantly, you know, throughout the 1740s, especially, and 50s, 60s, trying to create tax reform. They, in fact, want to lower the price of tea, not just for consumers, but to keep the East India Company happy. So, you know, initial reforms in the 1740s kind of say, okay, we'll give you rebates or drawbacks for those excise taxes, that inland duty tax. If you re-export this tea to North America, we won't make you pay that, but we'll reduce the tax to, you know, one or four shillings a pound. Even those don't cut into, you know, the growing amount of smuggling that is going on in North America. Now, you know, to smuggle is dangerous, right? Because there are restrictions. And by the 1760s, especially after the Seven Years' War, there's a growing presence, right, of the British Navy and customs officials and people who can look at your ship manifesto and certificate right, and say, well, you know, you do or do not have the right to ship this tea you seem to have on board. So it is dangerous, and you end up with a growing number of smuggling routes kind of in the coves along the coast between major cities, you know, between New York and Philadelphia. There were several places on Long Island or along what's today the Connecticut coast that were perfect places to land You also have, not surprisingly, Americans who worked in the customs office who found that they could make a little extra money by taking a bribe here and there and allowing some of this illegal trade to come through. So the British are hard pressed both to find that balance of tax reform to lower the price, but they're also trying to enforce, you know, their navigation acts and revenue stream, these tax duties that need to be paid. And they're kind of at a loss. Yeah, the British tax reform measures. We should take a look at how these worked. Jane, would you tell us about one of these reform measures, the Tea Act of 1773, 
How did this act impact the duties that the British government actually charged on legally imported tea? The tea tax was part of two things. I mean, one of it was a reform on taxes and trying to increase the sale of tea to North America. But a bigger part of it, and I think what Parliament was really focusing on, was to help the East India Company remain afloat. Right By the 1760s, they had, in fact, become a company too big to fail. I mean, I use that term because it's kind of easy to imagine what that means today, right? Too big to fail in that the East India Company was inextricably interdependent with Great Britain and its government. They had taken out a lot of loans from the Bank of England, which was essentially the financial arm of the British government. They had this agreement with the British government that they would kick back 400,000 sterling pounds per year to help both fund this loan, but also give ready cash to operations for Great Britain. As they ensconced themselves in India, in Bengal, for instance, they are also kind of the governing face, you know, the imperial face of Great Britain there. By the 1760s, they had really spent a lot of money raising an army, conquering the province, really, of Bengal, becomes a province of the East India Company. And they're on the verge of bankruptcy because of the cost of this dominance in India. So Britain in 1773 wants to somehow make sure that they maintain their financial stability. They pass a series of acts that give relief to them. They make a loan of 1.4 million pounds in exchange for oversight by the government. They send a governor to Bengal. Warren Hastings gets sent for diplomatic functions and governing both the actions of the company as well as the trading and commercial aspects of India. But the Tea Act then is also trying to find a way to get more money into the coffers, not just of England, but of East India Company. They cut out the middlemen, and the Tea Act allows the East India Company the right to sell directly to American merchants rather than through this wholesale auctioning that they had been doing in England. They withdrew or rebated, often called a drawback, of all those tax duties on the tea for re-exportation to North America. They didn't have to pay the 25% value-added tax. They didn't have to pay this inland duty tax. They kept one small tax on tea, and that was a three penny per pound tax. I mean, in the mind, I think, of Parliament in making this deal was that this is going to make tea cheaper for American consumers, certainly cheaper than for British consumers. This is going to give Americans direct access to tea, and not just old green tea and bohia, black tea, but we're going to provide these new varieties. So they are going to really purchase more tea because they're going to see the kind of varieties that they have not seen in North America. I always say to my students at this point, you know, like, why the Boston Tea Party? If tea was going to be cheaper, you know, why the reaction against the sale of tea, this extension of tea? And what's really interesting is that I noticed that activists, patriots in the 1770s, and who are specifically talking out about this Tea Act of 1773 with direct access to American markets, focus not on the tax itself, right? Even though that becomes sort of this symbol, right? That the three pennies per pound, three pence per pound tax. They often focused more on the East India Company and its role as a monopoly in their American markets. You have guys, for instance, like John Dickinson writing these pamphlets saying, you know, it's not the tax. It's about the East India Company monopoly. Their conduct in Asia has been horrific. They have abused local peoples there. They really recognized that this expansion of monopoly in a global economy had an impact and effects even in local and American markets. Their fear was that that monopoly would, in fact, come to America and that it was a slippery slope, right? Here they have monopoly on selling tea to us. Soon the East India Company will set up warehouses and they will have sole right to sell us every good 
that comes from the world, right? We will have no control over our own market. Given all the historical sources that you've looked at, and given the significance of smuggling in British North America, do you think the British government's change in the tax rate on tea with the Tea Act of 1773 was a logical response to its need to raise more revenue from the colonies? Yeah, at least in their mind it was. Again, it was sort of this balancing act that they'd been trying to combat smuggling. They had been trying to maintain the revenue stream that tax on tea brought. They were trying not to alienate British merchants. They're trying to entice new consumers. And so in their minds, to lower the tax on tea, make it more directly available, was the logical step, right? If we can compete with Dutch tea, if we can compete with the prices that American merchants found in the French West Indies, we can bring them back as consumers. The hope to compete there, I think what they were not ready for was just the symbolism that tea had kind of taken on, right? During the boycotts and the non-importation protests of the 1760s, tea really kind of emerged even before 1773, but it emerged as this symbol of British imperialism and oppression. And it was really hard to kind of unlink those ideas. In your book, The Trouble with Tea, you discuss the challenges that merchants, small traders and ordinary men and women faced when trying to buy and sell tea. And I wonder if you would tell us about some of those challenges during the years before the revolution, during the revolution and even after the revolution. I mean, how did people's access to tea change over the course of the 18th century? You know, I talk about early in the 18th century, the, you know, the 1730s and 40s as a period of time when the demand for tea isn't really great, but that slowly, again, through this supply of tea, through advertising, and certainly through kind of the labor and payment of individuals with tea, habituates Americans to drinking it. And then, you know, by the 1740s and 50s, this becomes not just a luxury, but many people see it as a kind of daily necessity, something that's a pleasure. And so before the war, you know, as I guess tea is becoming politicized in the 1760s, in the post-Seven Wars period, the demand for tea is actually pretty steady. Boycotts were used after the Stamp Act was passed in 1765. Boycotts of British goods were certainly used after 1767 when the Townsend Acts were passed. And tea was one of these specific commodities labeled as an enumerated or taxed good. But I found that often it didn't really stymie the ability or the demand for it. If someone didn't want to buy legal, you know, tea, they would find a way to purchase smuggled tea, right? But it really isn't until after 1774, right? The Boston Tea Party, the destruction of tea, and then the punishment of Boston through the coercive acts changes, I think, the political debate over tea, but only for a couple of years, I have to say. The Continental Congress is convened by the end of 1774, and this is before the revolution, right, and the fighting really begins. But the Continental Congress wants to make British trade, and they name tea in particular, as an item that we need to banish, that we need to cut off trade with Great Britain through this continental-wide boycott in order to make a point about parliamentary attempts to raise revenue. And so you do see a couple of years, 74, 75, 76 in particular, tea has been politicized. And by the way, even smuggled tea has a bad reputation during this period, certainly associated with British policy and that East India Company monopoly. And once the fighting begins, 75, 76, just the logistics of getting tea, of course, is stymied. Still. <laughs> What I find interesting is during the war itself, by 1776, 77, there is this underlying lying consumer demand for tea. And indeed, when soldiers and officers in the Continental Army 
are confiscating goods on their list of provisions that they really want from individual storekeepers that they're going into debate over provisions with is tea, right? And we also see consumers starting to demand accountability of merchants during wartime because what happens during wartime, of course, is merchants will be careful about keeping back goods that they feel they can get a little more money for if they hoard it or kind of hold it. And women begin to protest and complain directly to Congress or to their state provincial councils about the availability of food. But in particular, for some reason, tea becomes this commodity that women consumers in particular are demanding access to. They accuse merchants of hoarding tea and charging too much for it. And indeed, food riots throughout the North, in New York and Massachusetts, we see by the late 1770s, target this accessibility question, right? Merchants are trying to make money off of our scarcity. They should provide tea at a fair price. We see women, in fact, breaking into some shops and confiscating these hoarded goods for themselves and bringing them up for sale at a fair price. It's really intriguing the ways that tea is kind of politicized in a different way during the American Revolution as something that is now a necessity, part of life, and is being kept out of our hands by these greedy merchants. You also asked about after the war, and I was also struck with how quickly demand and accessibility of tea kind of comes back in the aftermath of the war. You know, part of this is state governments. You know, states saw the demand for a commodity like tea, and they embraced tea as a stream of revenue for themselves. And this is prior to the Constitution. And so each state is trying to create its own budget and figure out, well, where can we kind of plug into commerce, right, to either tax imports or excise taxes on goods. And tea, again, was specifically named as a commodity that we could tax as a component of our state tax and to raise revenue with it. Even the Congress, right under the federal constitution, when it meets, decides some of its first policies are about commerce, commercial policies about import taxes, excise taxes, and they name almost at the top of the list to commodities like tea, uh, central to new American-based trade with Asia. And indeed, they need to be taxed, but at a reasonable cost. And in order to kind of encourage American trade versus foreign merchant trade. So there's a protectionist taxes put in place as well to encourage trade with Asia and tea being central to that. In the 17th and 18th centuries, global trade was as much about political competition between European empires as it was about bringing consumer items back to Europe and to the Americas. In fact, it was imperial competition that helped tea become a thing in British North America. During the 1720s and 1730s, the English East India Company tried to make inroads into Chinese markets by cornering the market on tea. Now, the problem with this business tactic is that while it cleared the market of competition from other foreign trade companies, it also filled English East India Company warehouses with tea when there wasn't really a market for it. So to dispose of their tons of tea, the English East India Company set to work creating a market for tea in North America. They accomplished this feat both with time and with the help of London wholesalers, who sold the tea to American merchants and then helped those merchants advertise and create local American markets for it. Now, at first, tea proved to be most popular with elite men and women. Merchants and wealthy craftsmen who could afford to pay as much as a sterling pound per pound for tea. But over the course of the 1720s and 1730s, merchants assisted with expanding the American market for tea by using tea to pay for local goods and services. This proved to be an ingenious strategy. Because by using tea as payment, merchants helped distribute this new commodity far and wide in British North America, so that by the 1740s, the sale of tea took off. Now, whether it was because of its taste, its addictive caffeine, or just the social benefits of participating in the rituals of tea consumption, tea became a very popular trade good. So popular 
that Americans increased their importation of tea through both legal and extra-legal means from the 1740s onward. Now, we'll never know how much tea early Americans smuggled into British North America, but contemporaries like Thomas Hutchinson of Massachusetts estimated that five out of every six pounds of tea was smuggled tea. And although smuggling was dangerous, we know that British Americans risked the consequences of being caught in order to keep tea in stock and to reduce its cost. Smuggled tea helped transform tea from a highly taxed luxury good into an affordable, everyday commodity by the 1770s. It was the combination of the sheer popularity of tea and the expense of its legal importation that inspired the British government to pass the Tea Act of 1773. Now, as written, the Tea Act promised to drop the price of English East India tea in North America so that it would be even more affordable than smuggled tea. Parliament hoped that this act would spur Americans to import more East India Company tea than smuggled tea, which would also help the government collect and raise more tax revenue. But in reality, Americans balked at the Tea Act. They may have noticed how it would drop the price on tea, but they also noted its additional regulatory provisions. No longer could all merchants sell tea. Now, only properly appointed tea consignees could sell tea. Plus, by undercutting the price of smuggled tea, the Tea Act seemed like it would actually end healthy competition in the marketplace. For many Americans, these regulatory actions promised to bring the English East India Company monopoly to the American marketplace, an act that Americans protested in political tea parties just like the Boston Tea Party on December 16, 1773. But if the Boston Tea Party had not taken place and people had submitted to the Tea Act, would it have created an English East India Company monopoly in British North America? We can't answer that question because history didn't play out that way. What we can do is further explore British American tea culture before the revolution, because by furthering our understanding of tea culture, we'll be able to better see just how much tea came to influence local American economies, as well as the market for other globally traded goods. Now, since the politics of tea influenced so many different aspects of the early American economy, we should look at just one of the goods that tea created a market for. And as tea was a globally traded commodity, I think we should look at the market it created for another globally traded commodity. How about mahogany? Mahogany proved to be central to tea consumption. And like tea, it couldn't be acquired on the North American continent. We should speak with Jennifer Anderson, who's an expert on the early American mahogany trade. Jennifer has an extensive background as a museum curator and exhibit developer. Presently, she's an associate professor of history at Stony Brook University, and she's also the author of the book Mahogany, The Costs of Luxury in Early America. But before we get Jennifer to take us through the mahogany trade and its connection with British American tea culture, we should talk about the sponsor for our broader exploration of the politics of tea, and that would be The Great Courses Plus. You know I love history, and I know you love it too. I mean, that's why we come together each week to explore what happened in Ben Franklin's world. And just like you, I have an insatiable thirst for acquiring knowledge about history, which is why I'm excited to announce that The Great Courses Plus is offering you a free month of membership to all of its on-demand video courses. When you visit thegreatcoursesplus.com slash bfworld, you'll find that The Great Courses Plus is your portal to dozens of courses about history, each with their own expert guide, and that your free month of membership includes unlimited access to thousands of fascinating 30-minute long videos, or just their audio tracks if you prefer, that you can stream, download, and watch all on your own schedule and on all your favorite mobile devices and even your internet-connected television. Now, one course you might really enjoy is one The Great Courses Plus partnered with the Smithsonian to make. It's called America's Founding Fathers. Within this course, you'll find a video titled Ben Franklin's Leather Apron, where Professor Alan Gelzo discusses the life of the namesake of this podcast, Benjamin Franklin. So if you're curious about the many roles Franklin played over the course of his long lifetime, say, as an independent printer, public gentleman, nobleman of nature, and a tradesman who was actually quite skeptical of the wealthy and powerful, you should check out the Great Courses Plus course on America's Founding Fathers, which you can do for free during your one-month trial. Visit thegreatcoursesplus.com slash bfworld to discover more about Ben Franklin, as well as thousands of other topics. Remember, the Great Courses Plus is giving you unlimited membership to all of their courses for free for one month. So visit thegreatcoursesplus.com slash bfworld to claim your free month today. 
as it turns out, if we really want to understand the politics of tea, we need to also understand how tea influenced the American market for other globally traded commodities like mahogany. Jennifer, your research investigates the big history of mahogany and the way it became an important resource for highly skilled carpenters who made expensive furniture. So would you tell us about the development of the mahogany trade? In the 17th century, we see the very early beginnings of a trade in tropical hardwoods as Europeans venture into the Caribbean and then later into Central America and find an abundance of new and quite novel timber resources, which they were having in short supply back in Europe. But it takes a while for that initial appreciation to translate into a larger consumer market simply because these beautiful trees like mahogany and lignum vitae and other things that were native to the neotropical zones of the so-called New World were deep in the forest, difficult to extricate and very labor-intensive to extract. So you really see the beginnings of a more concerted effort to extract that and to develop a logging industry on the islands of the West Indies, so places like Jamaica and the Bahamas. And it comes in conjunction with a larger economic incentive to clear the land of the trees, which was to grow sugar, which I think most people are probably familiar with. It was sort of the main impetus of colonization in the West Indies. And it was really a byproduct of that endeavor that suddenly they begin to realize that if they're cutting down all these trees, that they might have economic value as a source of cabinet making wood and for other kinds of utilitarian purposes, such as shipbuilding. And what's the connection between mahogany and tea? How did the mahogany trade become associated with American tea consumption? Well, that's a kind of fluky convergence that these new, rather novel and exotic commodities are being introduced to Europeans and later to colonial Americans as well at around the same time. So end of the 17th century, beginning of the 18th century. And as tea consumption is introduced, it comes along with a whole set of accessories, accoutrements, as well as various kinds of rituals. So it was something special and regarded as having a context within which one would do tea drinking, which I often think when we grab a, you know, Lipton's tea bag and throw it in the trash a few minutes later, we don't regard this commodity with the same kind of specialness and ritual that people did when it was still a novelty. And so Tea was expensive and you would buy it in small quantities. And one of the things that people needed was a place to store it. So they would make or have made for them these beautiful small boxes that had a lock and key to store the tea. And in addition, they developed a new form of furniture called a tea table, which was reserved for the serving of this special drink with porcelain and sugar and all, you know, silver teaspoons. And it was meant to be a social occasion that people would gather around the tea table. And then there were other items as well made out of mahogany wood, such as kettle stands. But the tea table really was the most prominent one. And it's kind of interesting to think about that it's the ancestor, if you will, of today's coffee table, which people think of pretty ubiquitously. It's you know something you have in front of your sofa, you put your feet on it. And it's convenient, but we don't think of it in connection with coffee per se, but that goes back to its predecessor at the tea table, which again was a much more formal piece of furniture. You never put your feet on the tea table. It was used for the serving of tea and then placed back into its spot out of the way to be reserved for that special purpose. American tea consumption and the social ritual around it created a need for accessories, like high-end furniture made from tropical woods like mahogany and for complementary additives like sugar. Now, like many of the major commodities of the era, mahogany and sugar both depended on the labor of enslaved people. Jennifer, would you tell us about the mahogany trade's dependence on the labor of enslaved people? You know, one of the challenges, as I mentioned before, was extracting this timber because these trees, especially in the first blush of mahogany harvesting, they tended to be quite massive trees, often virgin timber coming out of areas that hadn't been intensively logged before. And so it was quite a large undertaking to cut the trees down and to drag them to you know, some kind of a water artery where they could be floated downstream and then loaded onto ships headed back to Europe. So because this 
begin sort of as an adjunct to sugar cultivation, which also relied on enslaved labor, it became the practice of landowners that they would bring in initially their own slaves, and then later there were people who specialized in logging who would bring in teams of experienced loggers, but they were drawn from the slave market in Jamaica and other places in the Caribbean and later in Central America. And the interesting thing is that in many ways, just like logging today is still one of the more dangerous occupations, it was extremely difficult and arduous labor. But at the same time, it was in some ways preferable to the kind of labor that people were doing on sugar plantations. And one of the key characteristics of the enslaved workers, for example, in Belize, which is one of the places that I've studied and where a lot of early mahogany was being extracted, the enslaved loggers would be sent into the forest, often just on their own recognizance to find the trees and bring them out. And so they kind of become quite valuable and important because of their knowledge and skill, which gives them a little bit of negotiating power with their masters and ways that slaves on sugar plantations didn't often have. Now, earlier you mentioned that as enslaved people were clearing trees from the West Indies to make room for sugar plantations, the lumber began to pile up. And with all this timber laying around, planters started to really hope that the trees might produce some sort of economic value. And it seems from your book, Mahogany, that British Americans actually made this hope a reality and that they saw tremendous economic value in the mahogany trees and actually became quite obsessed with mahogany wood. Why was this? Would you tell us why mahogany became a coveted, fashionable commodity in British North America? Well, it's really interesting, and it comes down to the material qualities of the timber itself. And this was true for consumers back in Europe, but in colonial North America as well. And if you know anything about the early export trade from the North American colonies, one of the main things that they had to sell was American timber, pine and oaks and other kinds of trees that grew in the North. But these tropical hardwoods, and mahogany in particular, had qualities of wood that were different in character than the ones that they had available. And it meant that mahogany, which is typically a very dense, hard, and the fibers of the wood are very tightly composed so that the wood, when you cut it and when you carve it, it yields these very smooth and silky surfaces where you can't really even see the grain once the wood has been prepared and transformed into an object like a tea table or other things like chairs and dining tables and case pieces that people had in their homes. And one of the qualities of that very dense hard wood was that it could take a polish that made it almost like a mirror-like surface. And so aesthetically, these objects were very beautiful in their finish, and the wood tended to have deep, rich colors and sort of a glossy shine to it that people became very enamored with. And it kind of went along with the larger aesthetic of the 18th century that put a lot of value on being able to conceal the raw materials from which things were made. And you see the same phenomenon in the kinds of clothing people were wearing with silks and silver buttons and the way other kinds of metal objects, like well, silver in particular, again, where the workmanship kind of disappears and a great value is placed on things that you look at them and you can quite figure out how they were made. And it's similar with these mahogany objects is that they just become polished and refined to the degree that you can't really see the raw material unless you kind of take a peek at the back of the furniture or underneath a drawer, which might be left unfinished. So that all kind of played into a larger aesthetic that historian Richard Bushman has talked about this as the refinement of America as part of this idea of kind of polishing one's surroundings as well as your personal behavior. Was it this idea of refinement that you were supposed to refine your surroundings and behavior? Why a lot of paintings and portraits from early America feature mahogany pieces in them? I mean, Why did artists like John Singleton Copley include mahogany furniture and objects in the portraits and paintings they created? Well, I would argue that it's a twofold thing. One, it gives the artist a chance to show off his skill in recreating and paint the quality of these materials. And 
So some of these Copley paintings, for example, have these colonial figures depicted in beautiful silks and their jewelry and every little detail and their, their skin tone. And also oftentimes there'll be objects surrounding them that similarly are showing off the artist's skill to be able to translate into paint the beauty of these artifacts. But it also, I think, connects with the way that the people in the portraits wanted themselves to be depicted. And of course, we can't tell from looking at a painting whether the objects or the clothing were real or if the artist's conceit and, you know, someone going and asking to have their portrait painted could ask the artist to, you know, please put me in with a beautiful mahogany table. So these were status symbols. But I was able to document a number of instances where people actually had their portrait painted with a specific piece of furniture that they owned. And again, I think that that kind of connects back with the sense of status and prestige that ownership of these kind of objects had for people who acquired them in the 18th century. You know, people who had the wherewithal to have their portraits painted and to own really fine mahogany objects tended to be among the upper crust of society, so among the elite of colonial America. But even average people could own mahogany objects as well. And one of the things that really surprised me in my research was to find how pervasive ownership of this exotic material becomes in the 18th century. So even quite average folk, middling folk, as they might say in the period, could own a mahogany table or a chairs, that sort of thing. But oftentimes it would be with less carving and less finish, simpler models just today, like you might buy an expensive Lexus or you might buy a less expensive car that would have fewer bells and whistles. That's a really interesting point. Was furniture the most common object made from mahogany or were there other types of mahogany objects that people wish to own? Well, by the mid-18th century, as mahogany really kind of enters the pantheon of materials available to American cabinet makers, it still is reserved for high-end objects, you know, larger objects, as opposed to the most utilitarian things, where initially mahogany was being used for things like shipbuilding, as I mentioned. But increasingly, it's being reserved for fine furniture making. And these were objects that people would have made and they weren't things that they would, you know, get a new model every couple of years. They were meant to be investments. And the key objects that people would typically acquire would be foremost the dining table and chairs. And then after that, other kinds of sort of supporting objects like tea tables, side tables. And in more affluent houses, you would also see case pieces like dressing tables or some people may have heard the term a high boy or a large case piece, basically with like an armoire. And then other more rarefied things might include things like bed frames or things like that, that most people would, you know, have their mahogany in the more public rooms. But for wealthier households, you begin to see mahogany in every room, even bedrooms that were private spaces, bed frames and armchairs and that sort of thing. Jennifer, why do you think mahogany was uniquely suited to 18th century American tastes, specifically to the tastes of elite Americans? Do you think it was because it was an exotic slave labor produced commodity? Or was it really because of the beauty of its glossy finished wood? Or perhaps it was popular for some other reason? It's hard to say. It's a little bit of a chicken and an egg question. But I think that on the whole, the, the reason that mahogany was so popular was because of the material qualities of the wood that people appreciated, that it retained value over time. And you know, these objects, if they were well made at the outset, would be strong and enduring and things that people would actually pass on to their descendants. So not disposable, but investments. And that all came down to the quality of the wood that people you know, took care of these objects. The fact that they were made with slave labor, you know, in a world in which slavery was very much part of the overall economic system, but often at a remove for people in Europe, and to some degree also for people in colonial New England, for example, there were slaves, but fewer slaves than in the West Indies. But I think that the fact that slave labor went into producing them was something that people didn't 
think about self-consciously until really as we get into the beginnings of the abolitionist movement. And then one of the ways that people try to challenge the system of slavery and the normalization of that kind of exploited labor was by trying to shape up consumers and make them aware that, you know, the sugar and the furniture that they took so for granted were the products of this kind of exploitation. And so, for example, there were efforts to promote boycotts of any slave-produced materials, including sugar and eventually mahogany. But I think it's sort of the thing that you want to keep in mind in the time period, how people were thinking about, you know, the larger economy that they lived in. I mean, to put it in contemporary terms, you know, we know that there's still, for example, child labor and other kinds of exploited labor that goes into many of the products that we use and take for granted. And it's only periodically that we stop and become aware and think about the implications of, you know, what the true cost of our consumer lifestyle is. And that includes the labor that goes into supporting that lifestyle. So I think similarly in the 18th century that people, they valued the material more for its intrinsic properties and the context from which it came, I think, was kind of secondary. Thinking now about the intrinsic value of goods in tea, do you think tea consumption would have been as popular as it was in 18th century British North America if the ritual of tea hadn't also included the use of luxury accessories like mahogany tea tables, tea boxes and kettle stands? That's a good question. I think that it probably would have been. And it's just interesting that, you know, over time also, I think you see tea become, in the term one historian used, it becomes downwardly mobile, that it becomes sort of more and more pedestrian and part of the everyday life. And yet, you know, some of those remnants of specialness still surround it. But would people have continued to consume tea even without that context and that sense of ritual around it? I think it probably would have, largely because the caffeine in tea has that slightly addictive property, similar to sugar and other commodities that were you know, being popularized around the same time, like coffee, like chocolate. You know, people consume those daily. And I think there you want to think as much about the physiological aspects of these commodities as much as their social context. <laughs> and mahogany largely went hand in hand. In fact, both commodities came into the American marketplace at roughly the same time, at the end of the 17th century, beginning of the 18th century. And the popularity of tea drove the popularity of mahogany. Tea was expensive at first, and when you have something that's rare, it's only natural that you'd want to show it off and protect it. This is in part how the ritual of tea consumption came to develop a whole set of accessories around it. People who could afford tea wanted attractive accessories that would help call attention to the fact that they had tea. So the American marketplace came to be filled with goods like teacups, teapots, silver spoons, and mahogany tea tables, kettle stands, and storage boxes. In fact, the material qualities of mahogany proved really well suited to the refinement and initial high cost of tea. The tight fibers of mahogany wood meant that it could be carved and polished into a silky smooth surface with a mirror-like finish. And it was this refined material quality that meant that just like tea, not everyone could afford to purchase mahogany goods at first. Of course, just like tea, the price of mahogany dropped as its availability increased. As enslaved people cleared ever more Caribbean lands to make way for sugar plantations, another commodity connected with tea, the price of mahogany came down enough that cabinet makers could afford to offer simpler, less intricate versions of mahogany tea tables, kettle stands, and storage boxes to a wider variety of early Americans. Looking at how tea helped drive the market for mahogany makes it easier to see how the politics of tea influenced the American marketplace. But it still doesn't really give us a good idea of just how the politics of tea pervaded early Americans' cultural lives or how tea came to be a political symbol of the American Revolution. To better understand these aspects of the politics of tea, we need to speak with David Shields, the Carolina Distinguished Professor at the University of South Carolina, and an award-winning scholar who has published on early American literature and culture and on Southern foodways. His most recent book, The Culinarians, explores the first hundred plus years of America's celebrity chefs. But for our purposes today, 
David's expertise as a historian of food, foodways, and the ways in which tea served as a central feature of political conversation during the era of the American Revolution is especially important. David, we've been exploring the economy of tea. We spoke with Jane Merritt specifically about the tea trade, and we discussed the mahogany trade with Jennifer Anderson. Together, both scholars helped us see how the global trade of the 18th century made tea an affordable luxury. So now that our tea table is prepared, if you will, I wonder if you, as a food scholar and tea aficionado, would help us better understand why tea was so appealing to colonial British Americans. Would you tell us about the taste of 18th century tea and how colonists prepared and drank it? Certainly. It took the English-speaking world a while to understand how tea would be prepared. When the first tea showed up in London in the 1650s, there were no instructions about how to prepare it. So in Garraway's coffee house, where legend has it, it was first offered as a commercial beverage. They actually boiled the tea leaves in water for an hour and left it in a cask for several weeks and then would tap it and have this liquid that you would heat in a mug in front of the fire. That brew must have been so tannic, it probably made your teeth feel like they had hair on them. And it wasn't until, you know, Catherine of Portugal, King Charles II's spouse, instructed the women of the court how to drink tea, that people actually knew how to prepare it. They're very funny stories, like the widow of the Duke of Monmouth sending a package of tea to her Scottish relatives, and they boiled the leaves and then threw the water away and ate the leaves like spinach. Finally, at the end of the 17th century, there was a good sense of how to brew tea, and there had been a growing preference for the black fermented oxidized tea, known as bohe, coming out of China, rather than the green tea, which was in China, the far more preferred tea. One of the things that happens, because there is no instruction about it, is that it's often treated as a kind of medicinal decoction. And anytime you have a bitter decoction, there was a general procedure how to make it palatable to English or American palates, and that was to dulcify them by adding milk and sugar to them. So that's the reason why tea, by the end of the 17th century, tended to have milk and sugar added to them, just like coffee had milk and sugar added to it, and chocolate had milk and sugar added to it, while in the countries of origin, they were consumed in an entirely different way. So the English treated all of these things as though they were medicinal entities at first and requiring smoothing out and sweetening, and they've never surrendered that penchant for sweetening and creaming their tea. Now, who in British North America consumed tea? Was it readily available to ordinary men and women or to enslaved people? Or was it just a luxury good consumed by elites? Yes. One of the things that we have to you know, be aware of is that by the 18th century, the price of tea was actually coming down. It was coming down because such vast quantities of it were being imported and actually so much so that a terrible trade imbalance emerges over the course of the century. But everyone wants to have it. It's an addictive substance. You know, the caffeine and the elation that it provides is something that people look forward to in the course of the day. And it's, you know, I guess a popular drug. Now, There are levels of society that don't consume, you know, the good qualities of tea. And you have to realize that, you know, several grades of quality are available in the Western world. And there are many stories, for instance, of servants and households taking the used tea leaves, drying them out and reusing them as a kind of resale market for used tea in the cities. And since 
there's a kind of gendering of beverages with the male coffee house and the female tea table creating sort of uh, gendered spheres of consumption. If you wish to be a fashionable townswoman and entertain you know, your fellows around your tea table, uh, you had to have good quality tea. And you made sure that the local grocery had it in quantity. And it was one of these items that appeared in groceries. That's where you, in a city, want, or even in a town, want to purchase tea. You mentioned that there were different types of tea. Green tea, black tea, fermented tea. Were certain types of tea more popular with certain types of income levels or genders? Yes, and we have to think, too, that certain types of tea had different functions. For instance, green tea, while it ceased to be the most popular tea for general home consumption around the tea table over the course of the 18th century, it retained its popularity as an ingredient in alcoholic punches, for instance. And gunpowder tea, which is the green tea that's rolled up into little balls, was one of the classic ingredients of many of the 18th century punches with Jamaica rum, sugar and spice. Indeed, you can think of a punch bowl as sort of the collection of all of the drugs of the first world trade system, you know, in one container. And there's even a theory that Ice tea in the 19th century was caused when someone who was a punch addict got converted by the temperance movement and swore off alcohol, but couldn't swear off all of the other ingredients of the punch bowl. And so uh, just left the tea, the sugar, and you know a bit of the spice left, and iced tea comes into being. I'd like for us to explore the tea table a bit. How did Americans set their tables, and why was the physical table and all the equipment or accessories that went with tea so important to the ritual around drinking tea? Every type of consumption around the meal or even, you know, drinking alcoholic beverages in taverns has its equipment. And there's also a set of performances that are associated with that equipment. And like everything in that society, the level of quality of the equipment, the rarity, becomes a marker of one's social standing. And this is a world that is as interested in fashionability and taste as a way of discriminating oneself and the general milieu of society as, you know, your cash balance or, you know, the size of your house or your costume. And One of the things which is interesting is that China, of course, produces teapots and teacups. But in the Western world, there are elements that Westerners decide have to be there that were never there in terms of the Chinese world. For instance, the slop bowl where you put the dregs of your cold teacups. This was a necessary piece of equipment in your China collection, but uh, it was something that was invented in Europe and not in China. The Chinese cups had no handles on them and had a more pronounced foot and a lip. And you held the cup, you know, with your thumb on the um, lip and your uh, fingers underneath the foot and they were sufficiently insulated so it wouldn't burn. But I guess Westerners did not get instructions on how to hold teacups and found the handleless cylindrical teacups too hot to hold. So they invent handles for their cups. And the decorations, of course, they become either conventionalized Chinese in terms of export porcelain or Sometimes Westerners dictate what they would like to see on the tea cups or the tea caddy, you know, where the actual tea leaves are kept or on the slop bowl and would send instructions through Canton to the teaware factories in order to have something made up to the local taste. Wow. If we really look at tea consumption and the different rituals around it, We can really see how Europeans and Americans adapted a bit of Chinese culture to fit their own cultural standards and norms. Yeah, there's 
some things that we have to think about in conjunction with this. One is that, you know, the general ignorance of the Chinese language is so universal that the literature, which is extraordinarily rich, we even have, you know, a Chinese imperial treatise on the water to be used in tea. None of that gets brought over. Indeed, I think the first Chinese book to be translated into English is a book of laws, and it dates from the early 19th century. So we have this problem of, you know, most of our ideas of what is happening in terms of Chinese tea, the instructions from the Chinese are generally lost. And it's only by observing the actual processes of Chinese tea consumption or the processing of tea. And one of the things that we have to remember is that the Chinese restricted access to central China. So you could only go through Canton to see what was happening. And it isn't until the 1840s when Robert Conquest, the English adventurer, disguises himself as a Chinese official and has bribed Chinese people take him into the tea regions to see how it's actually processed. And he secures the plants that will be used to create the English tea plantations in Darjeeling in India. So we have a situation where there is profound ignorance. And in the space of not knowing, Westerners project a lot of things and they create their own sort of material world around tea. So if we were to attend an 18th century British American tea party, who would we find gathered around the table and what would we talk about? Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, we have glimpses of tea tables beginning in about the 17 teens in Boston. And they're townswomen, often the wives of tradesmen and merchants. These are the people that set fashion. They're the people that get complained about for dressing up too much when they attend church. And they're taking a lot of their cues from the metropole, how women are behaving in the large cities of Britain. And there is a literature that gets generated by tea table women beginning in the 1690s. And some of this floats across the Atlantic. So people know that gossip is the sort of thing that goes around tea tables, just like the male world of the coffee house had news as its particular reigning discourse. The tea table had its own version of news, news about the social world. And the tea tables in time began to adjudicate, you know, all sorts of things about how society operates. You know, if you're a young male stranger in the town, will you be invited into households or not? What are your manners? And tea tables are particularly evident in New York City, in Charleston. We even have 18th century uh, indications of the workings of tea tables in Alexandria and Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So it's a world of women's social assertion that replicates itself anywhere there's a town. It is definitely an urbane set of manners and folkways. You know, it's striking to me from your description just how feminine the tea tables seem to be. It seems like tea parties were really occasions for women to gather, not men. Which makes me wonder, did women ever invite men to tea parties? And did men even consume tea or was it purely a woman's drink? Men did consume tea, and they tended to consume tea at home. The mistress of the household much more frequently served tea in the household than they did coffee. Now, there are several things to think about in terms of that gendering. You know, women were not generally allowed in coffee houses. They could enter into taverns. So the rise of a tea house is something which tends to happen at the end of the 18th century in America. And the first purpose-built sort of tea houses in America date from like the 18 teens. I think there's one in Philadelphia and there's one in Charleston. 
So you have a public commercial tea place that gentlemen can go to, but the coffee house is definitely the predominant male institution. But when a man is at home and the woman of the household is preparing the meals, it's usually tea, which is the caffeinated beverage which gets served within the household. We know that when men went to the coffee house, they typically gathered to talk about business and politics. David, did women also talk about politics around their version of the coffee house, their tea tables? It seems like, especially around the time of the revolution, politics must have been a very difficult topic to avoid. And yet, politics is not something we associate with 18th century women. Yes, women could talk about anything they wished. And one of the things which is kind of interesting is that just like the coffee house develops into groups of specialist interest where you had, you know, people who were interested in botany or people interested in mathematics congregating in certain coffee houses. You had tea tables that had particular women with, for instance, scientific or botanical interests emerge. There's an interesting set of papers from Scotland of what appear to be proceedings and findings of a group of Scottish tea ladies who were interested in scientific inquiry. And similar things existed more toward the 1740s in America than earlier, but there are people who have particular interests. In the end of the 18th century, there's a group of people who, in Virginia and also in South Carolina, a group of women who are interested in manufacturers. And they actually have members who go off into other parts of the country and draw up diagrams of various machines that they see for refrigeration and other things. Now, just as women might discuss politics around the tea table, they might also do so in poetry. In his book, Civil Tongues and Polite Letters, David discusses the importance of poetry as a way that women might express their intelligence and political ideas. David, would you walk us through a poem or two? Perhaps you could tell us more about the poems written by Fidelia, the Quaker poet Hannah Griffiths. Well, that's a very interesting group of people there. There is, I guess you would say, a women's world of literature dominated by Quakers. The Milka Martha Moore commonplace book collects groups of poems that circulated around the Delaware River Valley. And some of them are definitely political, and they tend to be of a loyalist sort. Whether it's Mrs. Ferguson, who is in Philadelphia, or Hannah Griffiths, they have a penchant for being on the more conservative side of the political spectrum. And Tom Paine is definitely a suspect individual in their eyes. But they communicate these things in manuscript. They're sent through the mails. So you have what is, in effect, not a tea table, but a virtual society that sometimes meets face to face, but usually conducts its business through the postal system. And it extends far into the interior of Pennsylvania and up into Princeton, New Jersey. We've been talking about the ways that the tea table was and could be political, and that it served as a political space for women to gather. David, were there other ways that tea, tea consumption, and tea parties became a political symbol during the American Revolution, say, especially after the Tea Act of 1773? One of the things which we have to think about is that tea suddenly has this negative dimension to it, and patriots begin attacking people who have become addicted to having tea and still try to get it after the Tea Act. So tea drinking becomes a kind of Tory thing. And there's a group of women in Mecklenburg County, North Carolina, a tea table of women who engage in a kind of, I don't know, a response to that by drinking Yalpon tea, which is the type of holly that grows. And it's actually theobromine, the active ingredient in chocolate rather than caffeine that it has. So this attempt to keep tea is a practice, but to make it a native tea rather than the foreign tea. And the Tea Act is kind of interesting too, because that action in 1773, you know, to preserve the East India Company's monopoly 
arises because there's so much smuggling of Dutch tea going on in America that the predominance of tea being drunk in the tea tables is not coming through English carriers, which is, you know, in direct violation of the spirit of mercantilism. So they want to enforce it and keep this British concern viable. And of course, they ignite a firestorm. Like tea, coffee has its own history as a global commodity. In fact, it seemed to be the drink of choice in the early 17th century, especially in Amsterdam, where merchants met in coffee houses to share news and conduct business. Which makes me wonder, hypothetically, what if 18th century British Americans had preferred coffee to tea? How would a preference for coffee have changed early American society, culture, economics, and even politics? It's an interesting question, particularly you know, considering that it's in the 18th century, I believe late in the 18th century, that coffee begins to be grown in the West Indies. And you have sort of local access to it. The English tried to grow tea in other places. In the end of the 17th century, they actually got tea plants out of China and grew some in England. And There were attempts to grow it in various of the islands and also in the mainland of the United States. But they found that the tea that they produced tasted nothing like the tea that was being produced in the high mountain regions of Fujian province in China. So they were greatly disappointed. But coffee, when it was brought over, tasted great when grown in the West Indies or grown in South America. So having a local source within the empire would have been an interesting way around the problem of having to get tea shipped all the way around the world, which, you know, makes you depend upon those English carriers. The rise of the clipper ships in the end of the 18th century in America is a response to the fact that, you know, no longer do English carriers have to do the tea anymore. We can go direct. And if you want green tea, you you want it fresh because it will go stale pretty quickly. You want it as fast as possible. But coffee, coffee is a beverage that remains so important that in the 19th century, it actually eclipses tea in American consumption among women. And interestingly enough, it's the women's clubs that organized in that century that are the big drivers of tea consumption. And Women's clubs differ from women's tea tables of the 18th century in that they usually meet in restaurants or in hotels. They go outside of domestic space, so it's no longer a right of showing off your fashionable China collection and the excellence of your tea. What you do is go out and and enjoy sociability and conversation with your fellow women in a cosmopolitan setting. Many Westerners traded for tea, but they understood little about tea in Chinese culture. So, like many Westerners, Americans developed their own sets of rituals and consumption practices around tea. And one of those practices was the tea party. Tea tables and tea parties developed into important gathering places for early Americans, especially for early American women. Now, as David mentioned, we can trace the development of these gathering places back to the 1710s in Boston where local townswomen, the wives of wealthy merchants and tradesmen, purchased tea, refined accessories to serve and consume their tea, and invited friends over to enjoy both tea and conversation. Around the tea table, women discussed whatever they wanted and whatever interested them. And around the time of the revolution, their conversations often included politics. Women had political ideas about the revolution, and also about parliamentary measures like the Tea Act of 1773. Around the tea table, women likely gathered to discuss whether the Tea Act might harm their ability to acquire tea. They may have discussed whether their husbands received or would receive an appointment as a tea consignee to legally sell tea. Or what would really happen to the availability and price of tea as the Act's provisions aim to cut competition with smuggled Dutch tea. They may have even also discussed what impact the Tea Act might have on their ability to host tea parties a social occasion and gathering place as important to elite early American women as the coffee shop or neighborhood bar is for us today. What's clear from our exploration is that 
early Americans didn't just move from social tea parties to protests like the Boston Tea Party because of just the economics of tea. They moved to protests like the Boston Tea Party because Great Britain knew of and seized on the importance of tea as both an economic good and as a social good to British Americans. It then used Americans' cultural and social connections with tea to try to implement taxation and governing measures that many early Americans disagreed with. Thus, tea came to serve not just as a powerful symbol of early American culture, but also as a powerful political symbol of the American Revolution. information about our guests, their books, and notes for what we talked about today, visit the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 160. This episode had a co-producer, Karen Wolf, who you may remember as our guest historian from episode 114. Karen, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us and for your help with putting this episode together. This episode also had two great sponsors, the Omahundro Institute and The Great Courses Plus. Don't forget to visit thegreatcoursesplus.com slash bfworld to start your free one-month unlimited trial of The Great Courses Plus today. Finally, are you surprised by the way that tea became and served as a political symbol of the American Revolution? I'd love to know why or why not. So send me your thoughts, liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment in our listener community on Facebook. And remember... Never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.